So this morning we're going to be in John chapter 11. We're going to concentrate today on the first five verses, verses 1 through 5. And the message really is about God's love, titled this week, The One You Love. You'll see that phrase again, <clears throat> excuse me, here in Scripture. It, it's come to my attention through my journey in life. I think we all look back or we all read things, we all experience things, whether we're in church for a lifetime. I, I grew up in the church. I voluntarily walked away for a time in my life. And, and do you know that all through that whole time that God's love was always with me. Even when I was doing things that are completely unhelpful and completely destructive, that the God of the universe, who made all things and created all things, continued to pursue me with His relentless love. And I think unless we look at the Bible, God's Word, as a book that is God's expressed love for His creation and humanity, we could have a wrong view of what God is, of who God is, what God wants, and how we are supposed to respond to Him. I think much of church organized religion has a lot to do with people loving God. Do you see? Let me clarify my statement, okay, by saying this. I think we live in a church world where it seems to be more important for people to get other people to encourage them to love God instead of help them understand how much God loves them. We're coming at this thing backwards. And then I think we wonder why we don't see the hand of God moving spiritually through His Spirit, which is present in our world. Because Jesus left who? The Holy Spirit as His agent in our physical world to do the work that Jesus did and do the work of the Father. That's how it works. But we, we think on some, some human fundamental level, church seems to be about people trying to convince other people to love God. That seems bizarre to me. Because how do you convince a sinner who's not regenerated or not converted, who's, the blinders haven't been removed from the eyes, the coverings haven't... How do you convince that person to love a God that they're rebelling against, essentially, that they hate? Even though they don't physically express it, you understand? How, how could a human being do that? So what I want us to look at is kind of something you may not have seen in this story of Lazarus before, that just became glaringly clear to me, not only through my personal journey, but my personal reading and my personal time reading other books. Um, in some of the Talk It Over sheets that you're going to get from me, you're going to see I'm going to try in the bottom corner of, of the sheet to not only give you helpful scriptures that back up the main text through the week that's going to help you, but a book that you can read from someone, it's either a book that I've read or a book that I'm in the process of reading. This gentleman here, Judah Smith, is the son of a pastor who ministers in um, the Northwest in, in Oregon, in, Se in, Se in the Seattle area. And he has an amazing way to communicate 
and exegate some of the fundamental New Testament truths about who Jesus is. So if you want to go online and check him out and check this book out, this is a good book for you to try and get your head around who Jesus is. Another book that I'm going to recommend is a book that Gene gave me. It's called Embracing Obscurity. So I'm currently in the process of weaving my way through that, which helped sh me shape this message here this morning. And it's not that there's anything obscure. It's we have an obscure way of thinking that's unlike the Father in heaven and the way he thinks. So let's pray. Let's read this scripture and uh, let's hear what God has to say. So, Father, we thank you for your word. Let as it goes forth with power and conviction, let your Holy Spirit come here and meet us, work in us and through us, that you might change us through your word. We love you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. John chapter 11, verses 1 and 5. This is the story of Lazarus. Now, if you know the story, Martha and Mary are in this story, okay? Lazarus, Lazarus is a focal point of this chapter here. And what's going on is that Martha and Mary are Jesus' extended family. All right? His intimate family, his extended family. And of course, he loves them, right? You love your family. Jesus loves his extended family. So let's read about how this story goes. Now, a man named Lazarus was sick. He was from Bethany, the village of Mary, and her sister Martha. This Mary, whose brother Lazarus, Lazarus now lay sick, was the same one who poured perfume on the Lord and wiped his feet with her hair. So the sisters sent word to Jesus, Lord, the one you love is sick. When he heard this, Jesus said, This sickness will not end in death. No, it is for God's glory so that God's Son may be glorified through it. Let's stop there. Now, how many of you, in the heat of the moment, say things that you think you don't mean? I think Jim knows where I'm going with what I'm going to say. I have to tell you that in the heat of the moment, in the heat of battle, when the pressure is on, when it all comes down to that moment of tense, argumentative at times, pressure building inside you, can I just say that what you say then is what you actually mean? And that most of the time, what you say about what you believe, under normal circumstances, really disguises what you really mean when the pressure's on and what comes out of you then may be less than helpful. What do I mean by this? I'll give you a story on how this works. And, and I'll give you the story as it plays out in my marriage. Okay? Just remember now, I'm the guy that thought that I had women figured out. Okay? I'm just saying. Like, it was a time in my life, even early on in my marriage, where I thought, this is easy. I'm, like, I'm telling my friends, like, dude, women are so simple. You just, you just buy them a couple things, you show up, you say some nice stuff, bam, we're good. Right? It's all, I thought that I had it all figured out. I know you're shaking your head. I, I can tell you now that I did not have it all figured out. Okay, that's where I'm going with the story here. Okay, but there, there was, there's an odd paradox of people that you hear say, I'm ready for marriage and I'm ready for kids. Those people were most definitely not ready. Just to be clear. I was that guy. And then there's the other people that are like, I'm so not ready for this. 
not marriage, not kids, I can't do this, I'm not ready for it. Those people are most likely ready. That's the weird paradox. So keep that paradox in mind as we move through these first five verses because you might find that at the end of how we describe God's love and our love, you get a different sense of the global picture of Christianity in general. And more specifically, how's that going to line up with what you're doing here, where you live and work, and where you, you know, find yourself in the place God has you. But I read a book at one point in time, it was called The Five Love Languages. Anybody ever read that? There's a guy by the name of Gary Chapman. I know you've read it. I mean, maybe you've even done a small group on it. I don't know. <laughs> Amazingly good book. I highly recommend it. Even if you're not married, if you're engaged, if you're dating, wherever you are in a relationship, get the book and read it. Suffice it to say, I needed to read it because I was so frustrated at what point in my marriage, I was ready to quit. I just, I got frustrated. Because in these, let me give you an overview of the book. There's five love languages, and they're, they're quality time, they're gifts, there's touch, words of affirmation, and acts of service, okay? I'm condensing the book down and helping you understand the five love languages. And the, the thought process is here, everybody has primarily two love languages. Sometimes you can transcend yourself into a third, but primarily every one of us has two of these things where when the other person loves us in those ways, we feel loved. Okay, that's the whole premise. In other words, okay, there's five of them. And my problem with this was that I wanted Lori to let me pick which two were hers. Because I figure, you know what, I can, I can bring home gifts, I can do nice stuff, I could be away and just send stuff to the house, and everything would just be great. And don't you know, I come to find out that the love language that I was speaking to her was not the ones that made her feel loved. Okay? So the argument goes, I'm going to just not even get into the argument. I'm going to get to the end where this pressure is on <laughs> and I'm going to say that things weren't going well in the argument. And unknowingly, I said something really stupid. Okay? And that's, no, that's not the first time. <laughs> the stupid thing I said was, do, I said, woman... Do you know that there are five love languages? Why do you have to have the two that I don't understand and that I can't give you, so can't you out of the five just pick two other ones? <laughs> that is not helpful when you're talking about your relationship on helping someone, help walking through an argument. So then what happened was, because all women, when they're 14, go to this conference to understand language, from, for a couple days, I would come in and I would try to recover from this stupid heat of the moment thing, which I really meant inside. I, that was the way I really felt. And the way I really felt came out. You get it? Now, not to say that the way I felt was good. It wasn't. But my point is, when the heat's on, as you'll see in this scripture, you're going to match that up here with something you may never have thought about, about God's love. So what did I get? Fine. I ask her how she's doing. I'm fine. You go to school for that as women when you're 14. They send you to a conference and they teach you how to use words like fine and nothing and everything's fine. They teach you that. I'm sure you get indoctrinated. Uh, somehow they must. I'm telling you. Anyway. At the end of the day, what I had to learn was that my wife is a quality time and acts of service love language girl. It meant more for me to, make, to clean the whole house and serve her than it did for me to buy her some thing that, I, that she mentioned to me that she wanted. She didn't care about that because she's not oriented 
to the love language of getting gifts. Not to say that everybody doesn't like lifts, gifts, but that's not what spoke to her. Interestingly enough, what I want to ask you is, when life gets rough, what comes out of you? In other words, what emanates from you when the heat is on in your life? I'm saying sin. <laughs> okay? And what we need to see here, and what I'm hoping we get, is the same thing that Martha and Mary got. Because Martha and Mary in this story fundamentally understand something about Jesus and about God that I don't think we truly get. And it's this issue that surrounds the Creator and His love. When... When the heat is on here in this scripture, I mean, think about it. Their brother is dying. Now, when you're in a pressurized situation like this, okay, and you know the cure that could fix your loved one, and you have to write a note explaining what's going on, to try and convince somebody to do something, okay, your note would probably be very long and very descriptive, right? In other words, if Sam is trying to write me about her mother who is dying, and she knows I have an answer, she's probably going to express in that letter a lot of things about her mother and how much her mother wants me to come and help or how much her mother might love me and there might be a weird tone to the letter. In other words, if I'm writing a letter to Jesus about saving Lori, my letter might sound something like this. Lord, I'm writing because Lori is sick and Lord, you know how much she loves you. You know how much she, that you mean to her in her life. You know, she has served you. And that letter might go on and on about a lot of things about how much Lori loves Jesus. Okay? Let's look at the note. Jesus is a couple towns away. He's with his disciples, trying to get them on the same page to doing the things that he wants done. And along comes a messenger with the note. Mary and Martha's brother Lazarus is dying. So here is what the note says. So you're Jesus and you get the note. Now you and I would be expecting it to maybe say one thing, but let's look at what it actually says. This Mary, whose brother Lazarus lay sick, was the same one who poured perfume on the Lord and wiped his feet with her hair. That's Mary loving Jesus and worshiping Jesus. So the sisters, verse 3, sent out word to Jesus. Here's the note. Jesus, or Lord, the one you love is sick. The, the Aunt Martha, Mary. That's all the note said. Didn't say anything else. Didn't go into any long descriptive narrative didn't go into any further detail. And it reveals what Martha and Mary both believe about God. Lord, the one you love is sick. Period. Jesus reads the note. And that's all it says. Now... Here's the thing that if you don't walk away with anything else out of this first half of this message, please walk away with this. Martha and Mary both believe that what moves God the most is Jesus' love for Lazarus, not Lazarus' love for Jesus. 
Do you understand that in the world we live in, what moves God of heaven the most is His love for you? Not your love for Him. What moves the God of heaven to do the things that God does, guess what? It's God. God moves God. God's relentless, amazing, ridiculous pursuit of human beings is what moves Jesus to go on the journey to go heal Lazarus. Not anything that Martha said about how much Martha loves Jesus, not how much Mary loves Jesus, even though the scriptures point out she was the one that poured the perfume over, the expensive perfume, the whole thing. None of that had anything to do with moving Jesus, the God-man, in the direction of going to see or heal or do anything for Lazarus. The only thing that moved them was his love for him. That's what it says. And I think, though many times that I've read it, I never put this together. I just never for some reason thought about it that way. And it dawned on me that what moves God to work in my life is God's love for me, not my love for Him. Now think about it in the context of the gospel. If the gospel's good news, and everybody say amen, it's good news. Amen. It's only good news because God loves His creation. Not because His creation loves God. It's not like God's up in heaven, pacing back and forth, going, oh, wow, I don't know, look at all that. I don't think they love me enough for me to do anything. Do you think? I don't, I, don't, I don't think. I don't think Fred loves me. Like, I don't know. Like, God's not undecided in heaven about what he's done or going to do now or going to do tomorrow. There's no decision on God's part about what he's decided to do with his relentless pursuit of people. So if we, as Christ followers, aren't moved by the same very thing that the God of heaven is moved by, then what is the whole point of the gospel? Chuck doesn't go to Africa because he loves Africa. I can assure you of that. He goes to Africa because God loves African people. That's the good news. God sent us to Katanning not because we feel like we have to express our great love back to God, but because God loves people here in Katanning, so that's why he's setting people free and sending people out with the gospel, because he loves these people. And we tend to think in terms of another kind of love, which is not the kind of love that is motivated Jesus to do the things he did. And that's what we're going to talk about right now. The focus of the gospel isn't our love for God. The focus of the gospel is the good news that, hey, guess what? Guess what? Here's the news flash. God loves bad people, Devin. He died for bad people, sinning people. So the people that you see that are doing all kinds of crazy things, he loves those people. He is an ever-present pursuit of all people. 100% of the time, all day, every day, God's love being poured out to keep this ball turning and the sun coming up and the moon rising to keep the water from swallowing us all up so that the tide's right. Every molecule that he created, everything is held together, not because of all the stuff, it's because of his love for people. Period. People like you, people like me, the most heinous people in the world. Do you know that as, un, as goofy as it may sound, the guy on television that you see on Fox News, whatever news you watch, that beheaded the American journalist, God loves that guy. That does not mean that just because God loves that guy, that that guy is going to love God. But what I'm telling you is, that doesn't ever change anything that God does. Do you understand? God's love isn't something that is going to be changed or altered because of what people do or don't do. Some will, 
some won't. That's a personal choice. That kind of love is a love that is down here on a human level. And the Bible reveals that kind of love. If we do a word study, we know that in the Greek text, in the Latin form, that's called phileo. God doesn't phileo us. We phileo in love towards each other. You understand? The kind of love that is the unrelenting, all-encapsulating, relentless, pursuing love is agape love. That's God's love. Do you understand God's love? Um, it's a question. No. Because in our mind, we think like this. We think in a phileo sense. Whereas, you know, I give Sam a gift. And say I buy Sam a car. Okay? That's, that's an act of love, right? So I love you enough to buy you a car. If I had money, I would buy you a car. But I'll tell you what. You better be driving that car. I'll tell you right now. I better see you in that car. I better see Facebook pictures and selfies of you in the car. In other words, that phileo love is, I give you a gift. You better use that gift. You owe me back because I gave you something, right? I poured myself out for you. Oh, you don't like the car, huh? So you ain't driving it. Now what happens? Now we start to build a wall. And what happens with churches is churches pour out God's love that God pours inside of each one of us and they don't see the type of reciprocating phileo love back from people and what ends up happening? They build a wall. They build a wall, they stay inside their fort and complain about all the people out there that aren't loving them back or aren't loving God the way they think they should be loving God. Amen. That's not the gospel. Chuck doesn't go to Africa into villages on a dinghy with supplies for any other reason than to let those people know that God loves them, that because of sin and their sin, they can repent, seek God's face. They can now love God because of being born again by the Spirit, and then he leaves. But he doesn't abandon them. He doesn't not, not love them because some of those people... I'm sure may, along your journey, have rather cut his head off and ate him because that's the kind of places he can end up going where they don't really care. But that's not what motivates missionaries, hopefully, to do what they do. The good news of the gospel and God's love. In America, the problem here, folks, is that we have it backwards. We're working out of a concept of this phileo love inside of the human nature of man, and we're not working out of the concept of the agape love of God, which is reflected here in this first half of this scripture. If you look at John 3.16, you can get a picture of this. Now, this is the scripture, friends, that I want you to know that Tim Tebow wrote. John 3.16. You're supposed to laugh at that. Okay, ha, ha, ha. No, he didn't write it. He, in recent times, has made it pretty popular. But look at what it says. It says that for God so loved the world. It doesn't say that for God so loved the world and because we loved God back, he gave his only son. It doesn't say that. The so, the meaning of the word so is so big that you and I can't get how big the word so is in what the scriptures and what Jesus is saying. What Jesus is saying is this. I so loved, in other words, I relentlessly, obsessively, compulsively, without failing, without one second of one day, am so in love with this creation that I created that I am going to go and die on a cross so that this sin issue can be dealt with once and for all so that I can continue to love you. 
And furthermore, not that I condemn you because I don't condemn you. I just came to save you. We don't understand that kind of love. But on some level, as a, as a group of God's people, we have to make sure we get this right. Or we won't get ministry right. Because five years from now, you may grow to 150 people, 200 people, and then what happens? You put the walls up and that's it. That can't be what God wanted and what we see here inside of God's love. That's not how it's supposed to go. The good news is God loves people. And that even though you and I can't totally comprehend the agape love of God, that's what by the Spirit He calls us to. In other words, I love Sam so much that no matter what Sam does, I love you. You call me, I'll be there. Somebody wrote a song about that. I'll be there or something at some point, right? In other words, if... <laughs> Michael Jackson. Get your, get your glove on, brother. Yeah, get my glove on. <laughs> this is before the glove. This is Jackson Fire. Ain't no mountain high, Fred. Ain't no mountain high enough. He threw me totally off track now. <laughs> he threw me. <laughs> I don't know how we got this out of order. Like, no, no, not this, not, not this, not this message. <laughs> this message. What, what I don't know how we got out of order was I don't know how, that's funny. That's funny. Here, here's my personal journey. It, not, this isn't just a recent journey. It's been something God's been working because I really believe that the biggest, one of the biggest issues we face is substituting these two types of love and thinking that we're honoring God when we're not. We're just honoring our nature, and our nature is the phileo version of love. In other words, the more I'm sanctified by the Spirit, the more I realize and you know why people need to look at us and see us unified? We talked about this unity. How are they going to understand agape love if they don't see it in God's church? Like, uh, you want to tell me, of, of all of the things you see in the media about churches, okay, and all of the stuff that's going on right now out in Seattle and Mars Hill with uh, uh, Mark Driscoll, okay, and I don't even know all the details. I'm just pointing out one thing. That's one of any number of things you can see. Are people going to see and be attracted to the church and the thing that God loves if the thing that God's lo God loves isn't acting in accordance with how God loves? Think about it. So that's going to not even be... How is it going to be successful? We know God never fails, and His church won't fail. But His church needs a transfusion of His Spirit. Sorry to say, period. God's people need a transfusion of His Spirit. They need to be sanctified deeper by His Spirit. Because at the end of the day, if we're not acting in a way that Jesus would act, and we're not moved to go to people and minister to them because of Jesus' love for them, we're not going to do it based on our love for them. Because the reality is, you're never going to love people that much to go do the things that God calls us to go do for people. You're just not. You might do it on a small scale in your marriage. You might do it on the small scale of your kids. And let me tell you, kids are imperfect people. It doesn't matter how much you pour in, they still do weird stuff. Don't ask me why. They do. Why? Because they're human. Because probably 20 years ago, I know I was doing weird stuff. I don't know why. Probably because I was raised in church and I got a lot of church, but not a lot of Jesus. So if all we're going to give people is church, let's just quit now. Because I could go give people Jesus, which is what people need. People don't need church. People need Jesus. 
Lazarus didn't need a synagogue, did he? He didn't need the temple. He didn't need for them to, to put him on a wagon and take him to the Pharisees and take him down into Jerusalem and call on those guys to try and fix the problem while he was sick and lay hands on him. No, that's not what Lazarus needed. Martha and Mary understood that the only thing that was going to save Lazarus from his tomb and his grave and his death is God's love. So if we're going to do anything as a people, as Living Water Church, we're going to go into our next phase when we go over here. And what we're going to do is we're going to love people. And we're going to pray for people. And we're going to take our preconceived notions about how much God does or doesn't love people, and we're going to put them in the trash can, and we're just going to love people with the love of Christ. And we're going to let His Spirit show up and transform and do the work that the Spirit is called to do. So that we're building unity, and we're giving people Jesus, and not just church. That's a key. And obviously God wanted us to be reminded of that because He laid it enough on my heart to make sure we all understand that God's love never fails. Our love fails. Human love fails. The divorce rate wouldn't be, I think, 72% if human love was the most perfect form of love on the planet. But I believe the Spirit in me can enable me to love like Jesus loves. That even though Sam makes me mad, Amen. Why do I, keep being the example today? I don't know, because you're just in the right chair. <laughs> even though Sam might make me mad, or Carolyn might make me mad, it, does, it, does it even matter? In the context of what we're talking about, can, I, can you be upset and work through, in the heat of the moment, problems with people, their messes. Dude, I'm telling you, when, when you see some of the messes, you're going to want to recoil and go, I don't think so. Mm -hmm. And I'm telling you, what Jesus says is, I love that person. And the only thing that's going to help that person is my love, and you're my agent. So how about you love them like I would? Martha and Mary got it. They understood it. Or they wouldn't have just sent a note, hey Jesus, the one you love is sick. That moved God into action. There's people out there that are sick. Jesus loves them. Therefore, we need to be moved into action in the agape love of God, not the phileo love of our human nature. We need to have that as a condition that we need God to continually work on us, transforming us, pouring into us so that what comes out of us looks more like Jesus' love than our love. Because there's enough human love that fails every day. And we don't need more of that, do we? No. We need more of Jesus. So I pray that we are totally, in this church, preoccupied, fundamentally preoccupied by His love, not human performance. I want you to get that. We're preoccupied with Jesus' love of people, not our or other people's human performance. Let's pray. Father in heaven, Lord, we thank you for what you show us in your word in places here in the story of Lazarus and the understanding of your love as revealed by Martha and Mary as they sent you that note and, and the fact that you... You left when you did because your glory was going to be revealed through how much you loved Lazarus, not how much Lazarus loved you. Father, we know that you call us to do things that are impossible for us to do in our humanness. Would you pour out your Spirit on your church all over the world in this time? that we live in, would you pour out your spirit here in Catanning? Would you be with Brother Chuck as he pours out your love in Romania at the end of this month to love people over there who may not even realize at this point right now you even love them? Father, 
we can't possibly comprehend all the mysteries of heaven. And we need to stop trying to explain to people every mystery that you have not revealed to us yet. And only reveal to people what you've given to us to reveal. And let your spirit do its work in people. Convicting them, transforming them. Bringing them to a place where you want them. And then what we will do is be faithful to love them with the agape love that you love us with. That you're moved by. Let what moves you move us in every way. In all things, we ask it in Jesus' name. And all of God's people said. Amen. And amen. Mon one second. Monday night, right? Six to eight. Thursday night. You can stay tuned to Facebook probably if we're going to add to that to get things together and keep in touch with each other to know where we're going to be. But my, my hope is that we're over there.